So now let's talk about the, the three-step approach that we take to JITASA in terms of putting in place a good foundation for your finance and for your accounting. And so, you know, talking to Mary, talking to the staff within JITASA, you know, I always hear the difference between nonprofit accounting and for-profit accounting is that it's for-profit accounting and then some, right? Um, and there's a lot more complexity and a lot more requirements in, in this sector, which I think for us is why, you know, this is all we, we focus on is nonprofit accounting because it is so nuanced and so different. And what makes it more difficult is that you have additional reporting requirements and you have additional tracking requirements as a nonprofit, right? So you have to track more information, which is burdensome, but then also you have to report more information, whether it's to the government, your funders, your donors, and other stakeholders. The 990? The 990 is definitely one that, that um, all of our clients go through. Um, but, um, yeah, but that's, that's a great example of, of additional reporting requirements that, that nonprofits have that are unique. And so as far as the approach we take to putting in place the right foundation is going back to the build, run, analyze. We're going we're gonna to stop and talk about each step of that process in a little more detail and talk about what it means to build, what it means to run, what does it mean to analyze. And so when we talk about build, the build phase, you know, we want to talk about there are three critical resources that are important for this phase. There's your people, obviously like people you have within your organization, the, the talent, and you want to make sure you have the right knowledge with people in place to, to lead and guide your organization. Um, there's also financial processes and systems, and so you want to make sure you have the appropriate process and systems in place. Um, but also one that's also appropriate for your stage, your size of your nonprofit. Because the requirements for a, a startup or the needs of a startup can be very different than a two, three, ten million dollar organization. Right? So you want to make sure that the processing assistance you have meet your requirements, but they're also flexible to the needs of your organization. Um, they should be consistent. You want to allow and put in place a processes that have the right checks and balances, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then it's also important to make sure you're, you're storing and keeping the right information from a record standpoint, um, whether it's for your, the, the grants that you have, um, for the IRS, things like that. And, and the last element is technology. So there's people, process, and technology. And you want to make sure that you have the right technology system in place um, one that's not kind of like Goldilocks, one that's not too, not too heavy, not too light, but just right for your organization. Um, the good news is that, you know, QuickBooks is probably the most um, common solution out there. And we found that 90% and most of our clients actually use QuickBooks. But the good news is that it does meet about 95% of the need for most nonprofits. Um, and I know there are some situations where um, you may outgrow QuickBooks, um, but for the most part, it should um, it should be most of your needs. Right. So, so basically what I see a lot of times is the size of an organization as it grows um, can sometimes max out um, QuickBooks. Now, a lot of our clients use QuickBooks online, so it um, allows for lots of access from, you know, home if you're working from home, allows your auditor to log in and see things you're doing. Um, you can have, you know, board members involved and reports only. So, but there is, there are times that QuickBooks does um, get maxed out. Uh, again, it's one of those things you need to decide from a funding point of view um, if QuickBooks needs your needs or if you need to spend more on a more robust accounting system. Great. Thanks, Mary. And, and so if you have the right people, the right processes, structure, and technology, you know, that, that's usually kind of a really good start in terms of trying to build that right foundation for your, for your nonprofit. And the approach that we take with Jatosin for clients is we actually take a team-based approach. And, and it really goes back to that, some of the concepts we talked about in the prior slide, where we assign every client an account manager, but they have backup from a client service team and specialists. And I think what that provides our clients and the nonprofit that we serve is nice continuity of service, right? So in terms of if, if a primary accounting associate or the lead accountant is out of the office, and everyone else in the team is aware of the processes, the structures, the systems that are laid in for 
that nonprofit. And so then there's continuity and there's no knowledge gaps as people fill in for that day or that week. But I think the big benefit you bring to the table is this concept of enhanced control. And I know it's sometimes that can be difficult for, especially a small nonprofit, is, is putting in those controls because one best practice, for example, is having separation of duty where you have a different employee or an associate um, do different tasks within the bookkeeping and accounting process. So you may have somebody that's going to enter in the invoice, another person that's going to approve and pay the invoice, and another individual to reconcile and make sure that everything's checked out at the end of the month. Right? And when you can separate those duties, that mitigates the risk or the temptation for fraud within an organization um, that can really do a lot of damage. And so, you know, that's one best practice that we recommend nonprofits apply and one that we're able to do due to the team-based approach that we have within our, our organization. So when you have the right people, and you have the right processes and technology and systems, you know, then it's about putting in place those proper activities through all three resources. And starting with the ability to set up and put in place the appropriate chart of account structure, what we call COA in the accounting world. And it's important when you do that to, um, to make sure that you know, your, your COA aligns to your 990 requirements from the IRS, accounting best practices, and funding requirements. And when all that's put in place, then it provides a nice foundation for you going forward. And the benefits of having a proper chart of account is that it provides a good foundation for strong reporting. Because if you have the right foundation, if it's built correctly, then the reports naturally fall out of, of that process. Um, you want to make sure, as Mary mentioned before, that you use the right accounting system for your nonprofit, whether it's QuickBooks, Peachtree, FunEasy, AppPost, there's a lot of options out there. Um, zero, but find the right one for your nonprofit. Um, as we talk about and show what a a chart of account structure looks like, you'll find that there's actually some big differences, as I mentioned before, between a profit, a for-profit, and a non-profit COA structure. And what we follow is the UCOA Foundation and their, their, their best practices. And you can see uh, there's a link here that you can go to and actually look at more of their details and, and the structure that they put in place for, for non-profits um, and for-profits going forward, right? Oh, for nonprofit, sorry. And what we do is we actually take more of a customized approach to the ECOA model. And so Mary often says, um, you know, ECOA is designed to work for all nonprofits, right? And if you take that, that baseline chart of account structure they have in place, it's kind of similar to trying to kill a mosquito with a sledgehammer for small groups because honestly most small nonprofits don't need all of those different all the account numbers and the codes that are listed by ECOA. So for our nonprofits, what we do is we actually use a scaled-down version of the, of the chart of accounts. And we, we always make sure they have flexibility to adjust the right line items and not have too much information, but also as they need to expand and grow, we can put that in place. And I know it'll be hard to see in front of you, but if you look at the, the sample chart of accounts in front, this is actually the, the document we use during our setup process. And you'll see that there's a list of accounts in the COA, and they're grouped in different number categories with descriptions and codes. Uh, but the front section of that, the top, the top section of that COA are accounts tied to your balance sheet or your financial position. And then the second half, the bottom portion, are accounts that will be useful for your income statement or your statement of financial activity. And we'll talk about those reports um, later on. So, and the other thing that um, we like to do with, um, especially for nonprofits, is set up the class system. And so, for example, obviously you know that you need to track the program fundraising and administrative portions. And so, for what we do with our clients is we use in QuickBooks the class system, and then you can um, basically enlarge um, the different programs you're trying to track or your different fundraising events. Um, and that way you've got, for example, a profit and loss on Wednesday night's wine and cheese party as a fundraising event or Saturday's art program for, you know, serving um, the children in the Bronx. So it's, um, 
basically it's a two-sided chart of accounts with the class system. We also use one additional one that we're not going to talk about here, which is location tracking. And that's, again, something that QuickBooks uses to add one more level of detail um, into your accounting. And so once you set the right chart of account structure, then it's important to make sure that you have the right financial processes that are tied back to your nonprofit requirements. So what we do within Jatasta in our build stage is once we have the COA put in place, we spend time with the client to understand their requirements, their processes today, and to come up with a nice go forward model um, that's going to include baseline best practice audit ready process requirements, but also that are tailored and specific to the client specific process requirements, right? Because you want to be flexible in that way. You don't want to be too rigid. Um, so it's that balance in terms of meeting the standards, um, best practices, but also there are unique differences for your nonprofit. So that kind of applies both to the chart of accounts, but also your processes and your procedures. It's finding that art and the balance in, 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 in kind of molding it to your unique needs um, and, and kind of going from there. Okay. So once you've built that right foundation, then it's all about going in and making sure that you're running things consistently, right? Because you know you must manage it and and keep it consistent going forward. The, the key you'll find in a little bit to having useful financial statements and data is to have accurate, reliable data on a consistent basis. And we often say, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So it's important to make sure you capture every transaction and all the layers necessary for your reporting as a nonprofit. Um, and so if you capture everything on a consistent basis, it's also important at the, at the end of the month to make sure that you're reconciling every account to make sure that they balance, that they balance out. To make sure that there's no duplicates, there's no missing transactions. Um, and Mary often said you want to make sure even that your AP and your AR, your accounts payable and your accounts receivable, that they're also accurate and up to date. So there's no discrepancies Correct. there. And then lastly, once you've gone through and captured everything, and then you reconciled all of your accounts, you want to close your books on a monthly, regular, on a, on a monthly basis. And what that helps prevent is the accidental posting to the wrong month, but also when you report back to the board, when you report back to funders, it also paints that consistent reporting picture each time you go. Because then they have kind of a, a clean, consistent number for this month to compare to next month. And there's not a lot of movement in between uh, month to month. And so that just makes, I think that helps with credibility, with accuracy, um, things like that. There, I have one question that maybe you can kind of, um, kind of elaborate on. So um, nonprofits often ask me sometimes, well, OK, so I closed my monthly book, right? But I found this one expense that came in after the fact, like what do I do, right? So what, what, what are my options and, and what should I do? Um, to, how do I make an adjustment to um, a prior closed month? So what would, you, what would you say about that? So a lot of it depends on the policies that you have set up within your organization. So again, if you are reporting to your board and you've issued a set of reports, those books are closed. Um, what I would personally do is post the expense in the current month, but make note of it and point it out to the board, saying this expense came in after I showed the reports from last month. So this is actually belongs to the month prior, but it's you know recorded now. Obviously, if it's year end, you want to adjust. You want to go back. You want to open the books. You want to record it for year end and prep for you know audit for 990, any of that type of thing. And if it's grant related, that's another whole area to look at also. So if it's a grant expense that definitely needs to go back in the prior period. It's better to reopen those books. It's better to make a notation of it and then advise the board on the next board meeting. Okay. Oh, so in the board meeting when you present your financials, you may have an asterisk in one area. Absolutely. To say you may notice that this number's changed, but here's, here's, why. here's why. And here's the reason. And, okay. and usually it's very clear. You want to always set a clear path for that. Great. And so to kind of give some more context behind this concept of accurately and consistently capturing the transactions, um, you know, I think some of the visuals kind of help, and, and what we have in front of you are kind of the actual things that you want to capture at a transaction level. So at, at the basic level, when it comes to revenue and expense transactions, you know, this is something you may be familiar with already, but you want to capture the timing, 
the amount, the type, um, if it's revenue, the donor details, and then on the expense side, the vendor details and the account code. Okay? But there's always going to be additional layers as a nonprofit that we need to capture. As I mentioned before, there's always additional tracking requirements. And so the additional layers we want to add to the green and the red are the program information, which is purple, and the donor information, which is which is blue. And, and so you want to make sure you know for the transactions, are they tied to a specific program? Are they tied to a specific grant? And then is it restricted or unrestricted? Right? And those are things that you want to capture at the transaction level because on the reporting side, you're going to want to be able to pull those apart and look at things by program, by grant, um, and within your balance sheet, know what's restricted versus unrestricted. So if you capture it beginning early on, it's going to flow through on the reporting in a very clean way. Um, rather than you having to go back and re-enter that information or backtrack, um, the earlier you catch it, the better. And what I see a lot of times, too, is organizations capturing this information outside of the financial system, which just allows for huge rooms for error. Mm -hmm. So you want it tracked correctly the first time and in your accounting system. Right. And again, like QuickBooks should be able to handle all of that, right? Okay. And so, so once you have that information, and once you you've run and captured everything, um, then you're now you're kind of at that at that end goal or that end stage where you're ready to analyze and report. And again, if you do everything correctly, um, you're going to have quality reports easily come out of that process. And so there's. There's a few categories of what we call monthly, quarterly reporting activities and then year-end activities. So on the monthly level, as an executive director, as a, um, a leader within the nonprofit world, you know, you're going to want to have access to your monthly financial reporting package. And it's going to look a lot like some of the financial statements reports we're going to talk about in a little bit. But you want to really have a good picture of, of you know, your cash balance on a monthly basis, um, your net income, trends, variations, changes, because that's going to paint a good picture for you as far as the health and the progress of your organization. At the board or donor level, the frequency of the reporting may vary, right? And so we find that some boards want to go deep into the financials every month. Some may want to do it on a quarterly basis, which is a very quick snapshot recap every, every board meeting, but once a quarter, go in deep and go from there. Your donors or you know, those who receive grants from, they may have different reporting requirements as well. So that variation is going to vary, but you want to make sure that you're able to meet those requirements and meet those expectations for those stakeholders. Um, and and, and the, gr the great news about this is that you know, I'm a big believer that when you have that data, you know, it provides insight to how to grow and manage your organization. And we saw that picture earlier. And you'll see some more examples later on, but, but it can really provide, once you get beyond just a spreadsheet or beyond just a financial report, it can really help you make decisions on how to grow the organization. Um, at the year-end level, there's a few activities you want to make sure that you comply with. Um, definitely make sure that every federal and state filing is completed on time. Um, the IRS is really cracking down on, on that. And, and now they're in the process where if you haven't filed in three years, you, they'll automatically revoke your, your 501c3 status. Um, there's also filing requirements by state. That can be confusing at times. Um, we actually have a resource where you can go and find your filing requirements by state. So please check that out on our website. Um, you know, make sure those government requirements, those filings are done on time. Um, but at the same time, you want to make sure your financials are prepared for your audit. Um, and in a place where your auditor can go through if that's required for your organization and, and really make sense of what's going on at, in, an, in an easy way. Um, but then lastly, you know, those, those kind of the first two year activities are more kind of external facing, but the last one is really internal. And you know, our clients, once we prepare a really clean snapshot of their financials for the year end, we find that that allows easy planning going forward. Like we do budget projects for our clients, and one of the first things we'll do is a year-to-date analysis of prior year spend or prior year uh, fundraising revenue, et cetera. And having that clean picture of the prior year and understanding what works, what hasn't worked, 
makes the planning budgeting process that much easier going forward. Um, when you don't have that information, then you're kind of guessing. But uh, as you know, information is power, and when you have that, it makes that process going forward much easier. And often, you know, going back to this picture of like of you know program um, revenue, expense, donor data. What you're going to find is when you when you set up all your information correctly, like we talked about, um, your reporting is going to allow you to look at your organizational financial data from many different views, depending upon the need you have in front of you. And it's almost like a Rubik's cube. Like when you have all this data, you can kind of manipulate or, or rotate or turn the data to create different reports and different views as needed. So let's say, for example, you want to be able to break down your expenses by program. If you have that information tracked to create a report like that should be fairly easy out of QuickBooks and Excel. If you want to look at it by year and look at year over year growth in your grant or donor funding, as long as you have that information tracked early on, again, you can kind of run a report and manipulate and get the data you need to look at that point of view. If you want to report on expenses by grants, and oftentimes, I know some grants and some funders will require that kind of report detail. You can easily collect that and give that to um, the foundation that gave you that grant. And lastly, if you want to look into a deep dive on a particular program and understand um, the money coming in or the expenses coming in, again, if you have all the information at your fingertips, you can run a program specific report very easily and have insights um, at your fingertips, easily available to you as a leader. Okay. Um, and so to kind of wrap up this last piece on, on the analyze step, you know, here's, here's a list of four financial reports that every nonprofit leader, whether you're an ED, CFO, board member, that you should know and must know. And we're going to share kind of the nonprofit name for it, but then also um, you may be more familiar with a for-profit version, so we kind of list it in front of you. So the first report is your statement of activities, or often what's called a profit and loss in the in the for-profit sector. Um, you have your budget versus actuals, which is um, like a another cut of that statement of activities. You have your statement of financial position or your balance sheet, and then lastly, this one is unique and special to the nonprofit world, is your statement of functional expenses, where you're going to be able to look at expenses by program, admin, and fundraising. Um, there's no equivalent in the for-profit sector, um, but this is actually a nice slide that kind of tees it up. And then what we're going to do is spend the, the last portion of the webinar going into each of the reports at a high level, and then we'll show you through a dashboard like how to look at that information in a new way. 